Good morning, and welcome to what may be the most unique worship service you've ever participated in. Uh, we know things are a little different right now, and we still wanted to welcome you to worship this morning. If you haven't heard the news, we'll be online only for the next couple of weeks. So make sure to join us and um, feel free to invite friends and neighbors from anywhere to log in and join us in worship. This morning is still the uh, collection for the Lottie Moon International Missions Offering through the Southern Baptist Convention. And if you intend to give toward that, obviously we, we're not in the church building, you can either drop off uh, that offering in an envelope marked that way for Lottie Moon Christmas offering at the mailbox on the Franklin entrance at, at the church building which is locked and secure uh, or you can mail a check to the financial secretary care of First Baptist Church 27 South Main Street or if you uh, prefer the online giving option there's not a way to designate the giving to the Lottie Moon offering. So what you would have to do is give that way and then send an email to nate.cornell at franklinvillefbc.org and just letting him know how you want that gift applied. This third Sunday of Advent, we're talking about joy. And I'd like to read to you from Luke's account of the angels making their announcement to the shepherds. This is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and following. Now there were shepherds nearby living out in the field, keeping guard over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were absolutely terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Listen carefully, for I proclaim to you good news that brings great joy to all the people. Today your Savior is born in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. In this Christmas season, uh, at the end of a year that has been filled maybe with discouragement and uncertainty and, and seems to be ending the same way, we pray that that news would bring you and yours great joy as well. Today, our Savior is born in the city of David. Let's worship together. Please join us as we sing together this morning.
Christmas is coming as God's joy for us. The promise of God is sure. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. In the season of Advent, we celebrate the coming of Jesus as God's joy among us. A day is coming when God will gather all, even in the oppressed and the outcasts will come home, and we shall rejoice. Until that day, we serve an aching world in the power of the Spirit, exchanging fear for gladness and worry for prayer. As the candle of joy is lit, set anxiety aside, rejoice in the Lord, pray with thanks, and make every need known to God. We pray for the day when God's salvation has fully come and the whole world rejoices. Don't, don't blow it up. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, your joy we already know and celebrate, but we long for our weary world to know the joy of a new beginning. Help us to share with your joy in all who are hungry or weighted down by the sorrow both those we meet every day and those around the globe we will never meet. Amen.
think back to the coming of Jesus those many, many years ago. In the humble barn stall. We look forward to your second coming. Until then, Lord, let us live in expectancy, never wasting a moment. We pray your blessing on Ted now as he comes to share the message you've laid on his heart of joy. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome especially those who are joining us remotely this morning. Our prayer goes out to you. Please take care of yourself, stay well, and we'll soon be back again worshiping here in this congregation and sanctuary. Over the last couple Sundays, we've shared two of God's promises, hope and peace. And we said that where can we find hope in a hopeless world? And we said we would find it in H-O-P-E, humanity's only perfect example. And that example is in Jesus Christ, his son, Prince of Peace, and wonderful counselor. And then last week we talked about being a peacemaker. What does it take to be and to make and to strength for peace. And we said to be a peacemaker, it takes peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. It takes perseverance and patience and prayer. And it takes energy and enthusiasm. It takes acknowledgement and acceptance. And it takes compassion and commitment. And last but not least, it takes everyone's effort to strive and to achieve peace. And so this morning, I want to continue to take this journey and take you on a different level to examine the incredible promise, the promise that God has of joy. You know, the world in the word of happiness evokes visions of gifts on Christmas morning strolling hand in hand with a loved one, being surprised on your birthday or on your anniversary, and just responding to unbridled laughter as we hear joy in the squeals and the laughter of our children and our grandchildren. Everyone wants to be happy, and we chase this elusive ideal over a lifetime, spending money, buying things, collecting things, searching for new experiences. But if happiness depends on our circumstances, what happens when the toys rust? Our loved one dies. Our health deteriorates. The money is gone and the party is over. Often happiness flees and now we see despair set in. But in contrast, the happiness stands joy running deeper and stronger. You see, joy is quiet, confident assurance of God's love and his work in our lives, that he will be there for us no matter what. Happiness depends on happenings, but joy depends on Jesus. Happiness depends on happiness, but joy depends on Jesus. The dictionary describes joy as an emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune. It continues to describe it as a, a gladness or a delight, a happiness. And while I certainly don't disagree that joy can be defined that way, I believe that joy is much, much, much more than that. And so this morning I want to explore with you some of the various aspects of God's gift of joy. Psalm 4, 7 says, You have put more joy in my heart than they when their grain and new wine abound. You see, this verse contrasts joy 
with happiness. In word or real joy comes from knowing and treating and trusting God versus outward, temporary, superficial happiness that comes as a result of our pleasant circumstances. Inward joy is steady and continuous as long as we trust God, whereas outward happiness is unpredictable. It's an emotional roller coaster. And when things go right, we're happy. But when things go wrong, what happens? Where are we? In Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11, King David says it in a different way, but confirms what Psalm 4, 7 told us. Listen to his words. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also rests secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. You see, David's heart was glad. He had found the secret to joy. And true joy is deeper than happiness. We can feel joy in spite of our deepest troubles. Happiness is temporary because it's based on our external circumstances. But joy, joy is lasting because it's based on God's presence with us. And as we contemplate his daily presence with us, we'll then find contempt. And as we understand the future he has for us, and remember Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that we have for you to give you a future and a hope, we will experience that joy. And so we shouldn't base our life and our joy on circumstances or what events happen to us, but on God. And if you want to know what true joy is, we have to go no farther than to look at Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. And that, of course, is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. If you look at that passage, each beatitude tells us to be blessed. Blessed me mourns than happiness. It implies the fortunate or inevitable state of joy for those who are part of God's kingdom. It's true, the Beatitudes don't promise happiness, they don't promise laughter, they don't pl promise pleasure, or they don't pro promise earthly prosperity. But to Jesus, blessed means the experience of hope and peace and joy and love, independent of our external and outward circumstances. You see, to find hope and love and peace and joy, which is the deepest form of happiness, we need to follow Jesus no matter what the cost might be. And John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11, Jesus tells his disciples, and he tells us, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. And listen, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I have told you this that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Don't we all want to have a complete fullness of joy? I think so. And Jesus told his disciples and us, just because he knew that when things are going well, we're going to be happy, we're going to be elated. But when hardships come, when the tough times beset us, we'll sink into isolation and we'll sink into despair. He knew that. And he knew that true joy just friends that roller coaster waves of circumstances. But joy comes from a consistent relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, when our, wife, when our lives are intertwined with his, he'll help us to walk through that adversity without sinking into the dilating lows or manage prosperity without 
moving into deceptive highs. The joy of living with Jesus daily keeps us in that level-headed, level keel, no matter how high or how low the circumstances. The key to joy is found in Jesus Christ's words in John 17, 13. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Living a joyless life is a common theme in Christ's teaching. He wants us to be joyful. And the key to immeasurable joy is living with an intimate contact with Jesus, the source of all our joy. And when we do that, we'll experience God's special care and protection as we see the victory that God brings even when defeat and sadness and sorrow seem certain. So with this in mind, I want to share with you and let us examine some examples from Paul's letter to the Philippians, which he wrote while he was in prison. And as all Paul was in prison, you will find that joy is the dominant theme in his letter. The secret of his joy, the secret of his joy is grounded in his relationship with Jesus Christ. People today desperately, they desperately want to be happy, but they get tossed and turned by daily successes and failures and circumstances. But as in brothers and sisters, even when things are going badly, even when we feel like complaining, even when there's no one else that's joyful, Christ still reigns, and we still know him, and so we can rejoice at all times, just like Paul. Paul knew, and he lived these truths. So starting with Philippians chapter 1, first two verses, Paul expresses his joy to the saints in Christ and Jesus at Philippi because of their gift to him and their joy in Christ. Listen to what Paul said. To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul then encourages the Philippians the followers of Christ, to show joy in all aspects and circumstances of their lives. And so this morning I want to share just a couple of areas of Paul's lives and our lives that we can find and show joy. The first area of Paul's life that he shared joy and showed joy was joy and suffering. Now that may sound strange to be able to show and express joy in suffering, but listen to what Paul had said. And if you take a look at Philippians, the first chapter, and go through the first 30 verses, you'll see that the whole chapter is about joy in suffering. And I just want to pick a couple verses, little tidbits, to give you an idea of what Paul was experiencing, even though while he was in prison, to be able to claim and show joy. Verse 3 says... I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then in verses 17 through 19, Paul says, the former preached crowd out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers, and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me 
will turn out for my deliverance. What incredibly powerful words. Even while Paul was in chains, he can rejoice. And then in verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you, all of you, for your progress and joy in faith. There's also joy in serving. And if we look at Philippians chapter 2 and go and read the entire contents, you will see how Paul expressed joy in serving and having others serve to him. And so verses 1 and 2, therefore if, anyone, if, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit, one mind. In verses 17 and 18, Paul says, but even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. I am glad and will rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. And then Paul shows us that there's joy in believing. So we know there's joy in suffering. We know there's joy in serving. Paul says there's also joy in believing. Again, if you look at Philippians chapter 3 and go to the chapter 4, first verse or two, you will see how Paul has describes joy in believing. Verse 1, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, he says. And verse 10 through 11, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's joy in believing. And the first verse of chapter 4, Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, my dear friends. My joy and crown is how you should stand firm in the Lord, my dear friends. And then last, Paul tells us that there's joy in giving. And I think we know that. I think we know that when we open our pocketbooks and our wallets and we give our time and we give our talent, there is nothing more joyful than to be able to share with others who have a need or don't know what it means to have joy in their lives. And so continuing, if you were to read Philippians 4, particularly verses 2 through 23, you would see how Paul emphasizes the joy in giving. Verses 4 through 7. Listen to how many times you hear either joy or rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then there's verses 10 and 14 and 18. I rejoice greatly in the Lord 
at last you renewed your concern for me, and yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply surprised now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. And there are many other examples and verses of the joy of giving. And so we see joy in suffering and joy in serving and joy in believing and joy in giving. And if you were to look at Philippians, you would see that the concept of rejoicing or joy appears at least 16 times in those four chapters. Whatever the, con the, whatever the circumstance, whatever the consequences all, Paul learned to be content. If you look at chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, he found real joy as he focused his intention and all of the energy on knowing Christ. You can find that in chapter 3, verses 8, and in obeying him. If you look at chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. You know, uh, <laughs> the Joy Candy Bar helps us to understand how we can find and show our joy in our lives. And you know, as I do, the candy is deep, dark, rich chocolate, nice and sweet, nice and sweet. But not only is it sweet and chocolatey, but also have those great big almonds, hard and crunchy almonds on the top. Well, these nuts, these almonds symbolize the mountains, rough times and challenges that we have and we'll encounter in our daily walk as Christians. But it's up to each of us to decide how we're going to deal with them. We can get down, depressed, and let the obstacles like COVID challenges defeat us, or we can take them one by one, put our trust in God, and become victorious in overcoming and removing them. The coconut is kind of a unique item for it seems that folks either like coconut or they don't. It's really a bit rough. It's a bit rough and a lot of us find it bitter tasting. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we can't remove the coconut because then we wouldn't have much of a candy bar left. And so we need to learn to eat the bitter coconut with the sweet, rich chocolate. And so it is with the Christian walk. There are some things that we can't remove or God just simply doesn't want to remove them from our lives because he's using each of these items or situations to strengthen the inward joy that he has given and put in us to show us that we do not need to depend on an outward and shallow happiness. But he also knows that if we're trusting him, we can rejoice in both the good and the bad and enjoy the wonderful things that he has in store for us. Like the Joy Candy Bar, it's a sweet treat from God and from Jesus. My plan was actually to uh, hand out of, to everyone a uh, Almond Joy candy bar, but that's not going to be possible. So if you don't mind, what I'd like to do is to spread our joy of this church to those in, that will be receiving food from the pantry. So God bless this Joy candy bar and May others find joy in Jesus Christ. Well, friends, as believers, we have a profound commitment of contentment, serenity, peace, and joy, no matter what happens. And that joy comes from knowing Christ personally 
and from depending on his strength rather than our own. We can have joy even in hardships. And I know we're separate in body here, but we're together in joy in spirit. As we said, joy does not come from outward circumstances, but from inward strength. Happiness depends on happenings, but joy depends on Jesus. And as Christians, we must rely on what we have. We must not rely on what we have seen, what we have done, what we have experienced to give us joy, but on Jesus who is within us. So this morning, let's rejoice with Paul in Philippians and rededicate ourselves to finding joy in Christ, joy in Jesus. Yes, joy. Jesus, oh, yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. close our service with singing.
Happiness depends on happenings, but joy depends on Jesus. And so this morning, I pray that may your heart be filled with the joy of Jesus. And that this week, as you go about your normal activities, that you share the joy of Jesus with others that you might meet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.